right. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to uh, get started today. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate the attendance. Um, and we're all very excited for the seminar today. Um, the final report for this research project has been posted online. And the uh, PowerPoint uh, presentations that will be shown today um, have also just now been put online. So those will be available. The webcast will not be recorded, but you'll have that material available. Um, and I have a couple uh, announcements to make. Um, first, I just wanted to note that uh, ARB staff in our industrial strategies division are hosting an LCFS fuel-specific natural gas and RNG webinar right now um, at the same time. So I just wanted to clarify that this is not that. <laughs> and um, this is the research seminar on uh, renewable natural gas. Um, so I'm sure all of you know that California will need a large amount of alternative fuels to meet our climate and air quality goals. So this project is um, part of a, a suite of projects that we have to look at um, producing uh, alternative fuels in an economically viable way. So we are, have this presentation today, and then we also have another presentation on Monday or December 19th. December 19th at 1.30, we have another presentation on um, the production of renewable drop-in fuels um, and uh, that uh, final report has also been posted online as well. So I hope you can attend that seminar as well. Um, so yeah, uh, we will have uh, Nathan Parker and Amy Jaffe presenting today. Uh, Nathan um, will kick off, and he is an assistant research professor in the School of uh, Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University. He holds a PhD in transportation technology and policy from the University of California at Davis and a BS in physics from Wake Forest University. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so yeah. welcome, Amy. Today, <laughs> so today uh, uh, we're going to present the final report on this, this project, uh, looking at the, the feasibility of renewable natural gas as a large-scale, low-carbon uh, substitute. And the <clears throat> I'm going to cover uh, some of the economic analysis uh, of the of, of the supply of renewable natural gas in California, and um, where Amy's going to cover a little bit more on the on the market aspects. Um, there's also an aspect of the report that we're not going to cover today on the uh, life cycle assessment. But uh, please look at that and enjoy it. <laughs> I got to operate this thing. All right. Try this. Okay. So. What are, so renewable natural gas is going to be methane from biological sources. Uh, and you can capture that, uh, clean it up, compress it, put it in a pipeline and get it, or get it straight to a refueling station uh, and get this methane into the uh, transportation uh, fuel network where you can have CNG and LNG vehicles to, have, uh, to soak up that supply. Uh, so there's... Four large sources that we look at um, in our report, uh, animal manures, uh, mostly we, we focus here on the uh, dairy supply because it's uh, about 80, 86% approximately of the uh, uh, biogas potential in California is from the dairies. Uh, there's also supply of uh, biogas from wastewater treatment plants that can be uh, converted or can be captured uh, and upgraded. Um, there is uh, a lot of potential in the municipal waste stream of capturing organic matter. Uh, and instead of putting it into a landfill, putting it into a digester uh, and capturing the methane off of that process uh, and producing a, a higher quantity of uh, methane than you would get if you put it in a landfill and tried to capture the landfill gas, um, and also a better, uh, more controlled process. Uh, and then there's landfill gas. So we have a lot of landfills uh, existing that are that are collecting landfill gas, and we have a, a large potential there um, for for capturing that resource and getting it into the the, the refueling infrastructure. Uh, so it's. <coughs> 
What, so in terms of uh, natural gas, there, there's, so for, to use net renewable natural gas, you need natural gas vehicles. So the question uh, has, has come up in recent times, uh, recent past few years, on whether natural gas is, can be really a clean fuel uh, or not. And somewhat, uh, the answer to that can be that, that, that natural gas vehicles can be a, a gateway to providing uh, a demand source with renewable natural gas that is a, an attractive resource and a very attractive, and uh, on a climate perspective, uh, greenhouse gas reduction perspective. It also provides a market for, for methane that can be produced um, that if you, uh, <coughs> that, that's a short-lived short uh, climate pollutant problem. So the, it, it can provide a place to put this methane and put a good use to it. Um, so there's, if you look at uh, trying to reduce methane from uh, the dairy industry, there's a number of ways to do it. Uh, adjusting the diet of the feed, um, there's some potential there. Uh, other, there's a whole lot of different ways of organizing your, your, your manure system um, to improve the, uh, the or reduce the methane uh, production from that operation. Um, but one option is to collect, uh, is the, to use the digesters to collect the uh, gas and then get it into a refueling into a CNG vehicle or an LNG vehicle and displace some fossil gas and have a good uh, benefit in that way. <coughs> so RNG is, is, uh, has this potential as a, an emissions reduction mechanism. So you, 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 there, there's places where we capture methane already um, that could be uh, utilized for uh, renewable natural gas, so landfills, we already have uh, uh, methane collection from the landfills and landfill gas. Um, some of the wastewater treatment plants are already producing uh, methane uh, biogas in their in their digesters. Uh, but the, and then also in the dairies, there's in some of the lagoons and and such uh, for manure treatment, they're producing methane that's not it's not being captured. Um, and if we can capture that methane, we can we can make good use of it. Um, the process of going through this, you have capture the methane. You need to upgrade. Uh, your your methane to either pipeline quality if you don't have a demand source for your CNG in place, or uh, a quality standard for the the vehicles if you're if you're going directly into a fueling station. I need to connect to either the fueling station or pipeline, and and then you need to have the use in the vehicles. And so, in this study, we looked at um, kind of generically getting renewable methane into the pipeline system. Uh, so that then it can be utilized wherever there is a, a CNG station, and not we did not get a, uh, get into uh, co-location of CNG stations with renewable methane production. So there's the renewable methane, uh, renewable natural gas is is exciting because it has a, has has a lot of promise in terms of uh, capturing these these fugitive methane sources. Uh, but what is it? Is it what's? Is there is there enough there there to make this worthwhile to to get excited about? Um, and in, in terms of California, uh, the production for the four different sources uh, that we looked at uh, in California, see landfill gas is the largest possible. So the size of these bubbles, these circles, is, is representative of the area. Is the same is representative of how much there is. Um, so landfill gas is the largest resource. If you were to take the uh, annual production of uh, green and food waste in, in California and, and divert it to an anaerobic digesting uh, as next largest to the manures and then uh, wastewater treatment plant. The <laughs> and for comparison's sake, yeah, if you look at the, the blue bubble over here, that's how big the current vehicular natural gas demand is. So if you want to get all of this uh, renewable natural gas into the, uh, into the transportation system, you're going to need to grow the demand as well as uh, grow the, the supply. <coughs> so that, that kind of gives you a sense of how big is the resource, but then is it economic? So to develop uh, an estimate of what the technical economic uh, as, uh, 
feasibility of this uh, resource is we developed supply curves of each of these uh, four sources. Um, and this is kind of the basic framework we use to develop these supply curves. Uh, we use collection of data of where these uh, landfills are, where wastewater treatment plants, what the dairy herds are. Um, and then, uh, so this is kind of point sources of data of how big a resource is in a given location. Um, and then we look at uh, costing out how much it would cost to produce gas at that source and collect it. Um, and then the cost of upgrading it. The, and then the upgrading it and the cost of uh, connecting to a pipeline. Um, and then from that, you can develop a levelized cost of energy for each uh, MMBTU of, of uh, renewable natural gas you produce. And you sort each source by cost, and you got to develop a, a supply curve. At the low end, you have the, the cheapest source, and at the high end, you have the most expensive source. Um, not shown on this is the... Uh, municipal waste, uh, where that is already on, a, would be collected on trucks um, within the system, and you have the possibility of aggregating uh, those sources into larger scale digesters if you, uh, if you can. And so we use the, the spatial uh, optimization model for siting anaerobic digesters for municipal waste across the state uh, based on the production of uh, organic waste in the state. So here's some of that data, if you can see it. Uh, I'll step out to the side. Uh, the, so there's a lot of uh, point sources here. We have uh, 1,400 uh, dairies uh, that, that, that we found, uh, about 150 landfills, 86 wastewater treatment plants, and uh, we cited with the model um, uh, 38 uh, anaerobic digesters to take in the, the organic green waste uh, for, for municipal waste across the state. Um, and so there's this kind of great diversity of where this stuff, where, where the resources are. Um, luckily, it, it basically lines up with pe where people are, except for the dairies, you know. Um, so these, that's relatively well co-located with uh, infrastructure. Um, and so, so this is, has a map of uh, the, the natural gas pipeline network. So to calculate these, the, this, this supply curve, you need to capture several factors that are important in here. Um, and one of them is the economies of scale in the production of the, of the methane, in case where you have to build a digester. Uh, the upgrading of the methane, because when you produce uh, biological methane, it, it's often in like a 50-50-ish mix with CO2 plus other stuff that you don't want as well. Um, and so you have an upgrading step, and then you have to connect to the pipeline. And so the connection to the pipeline um, is, you know, you got you can imagine that's basically a fixed cost. And so if you are uh, putting something into a, if you're, if you're paying for connecting to a pipeline, you're going to have one, um, if you, if you have a one cow dairy, it's gonna cost you roughly the same as if you have a 10,000 cow dairy to connect, to, to break into this pipeline and, and hook up all the equipment to, to connect to the pipeline. So there's some significant economy of scale there. Uh, this uh, graphic here is, is based on data we found uh, through literature and through uh, the CPUC comments um, from, from the industry in, in terms of what are the uh, the cost for upgrading and injection cost in in a in a California setting. Well, some of these are not in California settings, and then others ones are. Uh, we basically use this uh, top orange line in our in our study. The second feature is access to the market, uh, and since we are requiring this uh, gas to go into the pipeline to make its way to CNG stations. Uh, that means access to the natural gas uh, infrastructure. And so the access there, you have, um, this is a map with just the dairies uh, kind of clustered there in the Central Valley. Um, you get a, a blow up of it. Uh, you can see all these dots and then the little yellow lines are showing the distance to get to 
uh, the pipeline. Uh, and the graph there shows for from the fraction of the municipal uh, manure resource, um, how far is it from the pipeline? Uh, so not very much is right on top of a pipeline, but as you go out to like four miles, you're about roughly 60% of the, of the resource is within four miles of a pipeline. Um, so it gives you a sense of, of how, how much you're gonna need to get to those, how, how much uh, piping infrastructure you're gonna need to build, and that, that's another expense that needs to be taken account of. <laughs> With these dairies, uh, there's one additional aspect. When we first ran this analysis, we looked at taking each individual dairy and um, having them have their own digester and their own upgrading equipment and their own connection to the pipeline. If you looked at the, the map, the, the blow up of the map, you saw there's like a lot of them that along the way to the pipeline, they'd hit another dairy. Um, so the, the, there's definitely room for clustering uh, to improve the economies of scale on both the upgrading and the, the interconnect to the pipeline. Uh, so we develop an algorithm to cluster dairies uh, so that uh, we can get a, a reasonable estimate of if, these, if the dairies, in this case, they all have their own anaerobic digester, and then the biogas that's produced um, can be transported in low pressure pipelines to a centralized upgrading facility, which we locate at the dairy that's nearest to the pipeline, um, and then uh, injecting into the pipeline. So it, that, there's some significant cost savings uh, through the clustering, and I'll show uh, supply curves with and without clustering so you can see the difference. Getting into the results, uh, for, for the individual resources, we have these supply curves. So the blue here is the dairies. Um, they're, they're quite uh, expensive and, and going up. Um, the pink is the wastewater treatment plants, and the red is the, the MSW anaerobic digesters. And then the green, the low big curve, the lower bigger curve there is, is the landfill gas resource. We break these out by the components, uh, the, the, the digester and the, the capital costs and the upgrading cost. Um, you can see for, the, for this is for the dairies. Um, you have a significant amount of cost in the anaerobic digester um, and also in the upgrading. There's, there's a lot of cost in all cases for the dairy, um, so it's kind of relatively evenly split. And as you go out, you get, as you, as, as you go out on the supply curve, you're getting to, by the pink line, the, the pink space, when the pink space goes up, you're getting to smaller dairies, um, causing your, dairy, your digesters to be more expensive. And then the, the green goes up because either you're, because you're also getting smaller, or you could be getting smaller, and you could also be getting farther away from the pipeline. Uh, and then it goes off the page. So you can't really see at the end of the curve what the full upgrading cost is. So on the, so as I said, with the dairies, we, we clustered them and that, that curve there was for the blue curve, the dark blue curve on this graph. Um, so it was, the, it was the best curve that we had, uh, the components cost curve we showed. Um, so the clustering led to a pretty significant decrease in the cost. Um, through improvements in uh, upgrading. Uh, mainly, you had a, a major reduction in, in upgrading costs through economy of scale and also uh, some reduction in the, the cost of the pipelines to, to get to the facility, to get to the, to the, to the pipeline. Uh, for the MSW digesters, this one we, uh, it, this is a, an interesting case uh, for, for the, the, the feedstock here is going to be a negative cost. It's, it's, a, it's a value. It's a revenue stream for the facility it is tipping fees uh, from the, the organic waste coming in. Uh, and so the, the actual most variability we found in this is the, the variability across the state and the different tipping fees. Uh, so as you have a lower tipping fee, 
uh, you have a higher cost because there's lower revenue streams coming in from the, the tipping fee revenue. Um, I would caution that this I find to be a little bit artificial uh, in terms of how steady this cost is on the on the AD and the upgrading, um, and that's uh, a little bit of a factor of, of our analysis. Um, I find that the spatial optimization models that I've been running for quite a long time now on biomass, they really like to be as, they, they, the mathematical equations say build the thing as big as you possibly can. And so what happens here is I have a maximum limit on how big this AD unit can get, which is 200,000 tons a year. And it builds every single one of them 200,000 tons per year and, and brings in uh, uh, municipal waste from all, all over to, make, to fill those up. Um, that's not necessarily what we're seeing in the, in the de development of the digesters uh, that, are, that are being built today. Um, so there's uh, some reason to, to wonder um, what costs are missing here and, and kind of maybe not necessarily even technical costs, but soft costs of contracting and, and, and setting up all the contracts for, for, the, for operating with all the different uh, municipalities that you need to fill up a large facility. Moving on to the landfill gas, and here it's, since the gas is mostly collected, and this is based on the, the, the resource base here, is based on the land, land, landfill methane outreach program from the EPA. Uh, and so the methane is currently being captured uh, and flared in many locations. Um, and so the, the cost here is, is upgrading and getting it into the pipeline. And then, so the upgrading costs uh, vary depending on the size of the, of the landfill. Uh, the bigger landfills have a higher economies of scale. We cut the economies, the, the, the curve off uh, to where we had data. Um, some of the landfills in California are, are bigger than we have data for on terms of the upgrading cost. Uh, and so we didn't allow, we made you build multiple of multiple upgrading facilities uh, that have the same cost. Um, it's partly why you have a, a reasonably flat curve at the bottom there. Um, and as you get smaller, or uh, a significant fraction part here is, is the landfills in Northern California, you get pretty far from pipeline infrastructure and it costs a lot to get it, um, to build the pipelines to get you where you need to go. And finally, looking at the wastewater treatment plant RNG supply curves, another similar thing that we looked at the, the wastewater treatment is with, with AD units. We did not look at uh, retrofitting uh, wastewater treatment plants that do not use AD units. Um, and so there is, there is an additional resource that could be captured um, if you look at those. Uh, but these ones with the AD units, uh, it's basic, you have a, a question of are you close to a pipeline and how big are you that, that changes the, that adjusts the, the cost. And, and it's significant. Uh, if you have a really big one close to a pipeline, the cost can be fairly reasonable. If you have a, sm a small facility far away from a pipeline, the, the costs get a lot higher, uh, can get, go up by four times. So it's, uh, if we're looking at, when we're looking at the, the, the total technical potential, it's good to keep in mind that there's this really uh, heterogeneous uh, market of these facilities out there um, and that all of that, you can't just give it a single cost and say that that's what it's going to cost to get wastewater treatment biogas or landfill gas or dairies. Um, it's, there's definitely a, a pretty, uh, it, it's possible that the ones that will play and come in are at roughly a similar cost, um, but the ones, but, but, but that's not the full economic resource if you are able to pay higher prices. So a summary of the, the, the different pathways and the, the, where, the, where their costs are. Um, <coughs> so the landfill gas pathway on average is the, is elite, the most economically attractive um, just on a cost per MMBTU produced. Uh, and the upgrading and injection costs go from six to $43 an MMBTU. Uh, and the pipeline, there's uh, one particularly attractive facility in Southern California that 
is very large and has a pipeline running through it. So it's got a nearly zero pipeline cost and uh, uh, a low upgrading cost. Um, dairies, you have a, a big range um, as you uh, go from sm the, the smaller clusters to the bigger clusters. Uh, and um, on the MSW AD, uh, there can be, a, if you have high uh, tipping fees, you can have a large uh, revenue stream per MMBTU just for the tipping. So there, there's this up to $712 per MMBTU in, in tipping fee. Uh, so there's a, there's a significant amount of, of, uh, of a cost there that can be pulled in. At this point, I'm going to turn it over. So I was covering the, the, the engineering economic analysis of the, the cost curves, and, and, and Amy's going to talk a little bit more about the market effects. Great. So I'm going to give a, an overview, and then maybe we have a few minutes for questions if people want to go into the details of the economics. So I think the way we looked at this uh, problem is a sort of a research analysis problem is uh, really to ask the question, um, you know, it's, it's always said in the public domain, you know, is, is natural gas the bridge fuel or can natural gas be a, a transition fuel? And when people say that, they almost don't even know really what they mean. They're just sort of saying natural gas is cleaner, but we all know that it's not as, it is still a fossil fuel and it's still, um, as we've talked about, have uh, methane leakage and other kinds of uh, uh, issues and of course, natural gas vehicles um, at this stage, uh, though I think there's some promise down the road, um, are less efficient than diesel um, trucks. And so you have to take into account um, as you're using um, energy, how much more energy do you have to use in an inefficient vehicle versus an efficient vehicle. So that, that makes the whole question somewhat complicated, um, but you can actually simplify um, that question, which was what we found over the course of this study, if, you, if it was viable to take what is now a pretty commercial industry in the state of California, which is uh, natural gas trucks, and that's both, um, we all see the occasional you know, garbage truck or um, delivery truck, you know, UPS delivery trucks you know, powered by natural gas. Um, but increasingly, we're seeing natural gas move into the 18-wheeler heavy-duty freight industry. And, um, and California is uniquely positioned in that because one of the big challenges in having a national um, natural gas fleet, of course, is the you know, variety of routes and the expense of, of building the stations and, and facilities to um, gasify, um, to transport the gas and either compress it in the case of CNG or to liquefy it in the case of liquefied natural gas, which is one of the forms that's being used in heavy duty trucks. So the interesting thing about California is a lot of our freight um, is really focused on I-5. And so therefore it's almost like a railroad in the sense that the number of filling stations you need to facilitate a wholesale switch of freight over to natural gas is actually much smaller than other locations. Um, and then the second advantage in California, sort of new development in the freight industry, is that you're getting a lot of back to base uh, transportation. So even if freight is going from California to other locations, um, with the use of containers, you have this possibility that the trailer um, could take the trip for the, the natural gas trailer could do part of the trip and then you could switch to another trailer um, for, for longer journeys. So, um, so the industry is getting more set up in a way that um, alternative fuel can come into the industry you know, through the use of these trailers. And, and indeed, we see um, an increase in the use of natural gas in vehicles, uh, and most of this is, is you know, um, commercial vehicles um, in, in the state, as you can see from this graph. Now, we um, put together a, um, a spatial um, optimization model to uh, figure out, like, if we were king and we were going to place uh, down uh, the most efficient 
use, uh, so therefore the least capital cost, to build out a natural gas freight network in the state. And we actually used a national model um, to try to understand um, the logistics, because of course we all know there's the natural gas to, the, to California is imported, and, um, and one would imagine that maybe on a national level, you know, like Oklahoma's already put in a lot of subsidies to propel natural gas into commercial vehicles. So thinking about Texas or the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, you know, we had kind of imagined that maybe um, this freight network would be more economical in a place that had a lot of natural gas and less economical in California, but it turned out to be the opposite. It turned out to be that because California has such high freight volume, and because it's such a dedicated routing, um, that California is one of the most commercial places to start a network that could eventually be a national network. And, and there's some interesting opportunities for California um, coming from the new developments in natural gas in the United States. And that is because um, California gets a lot of natural gas, or will get a lot of natural gas, from a play called the Niobrara play, um, which is out by Colorado, um, and we get a lot of gas from Texas. Um, and both of, the, our, both of the sources of natural gas for the state of California um, are gonna really grow over time. The, the, the access to those supplies are gonna grow and they're gonna be a lot cheaper. So in the Niobrara, for example, um, investors are finding that they can develop natural gas for export to a place, say, like California at 90 cents um, per MCF. Um, and in Texas, um, many of you may have heard about the Permian Basin, um, which is sort of an up and coming oil production area in Texas. Some people say that its production could someday be as high as Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, it's like the Saudi Arabia of the United States. Um, and, and so um, the interesting thing about that field in terms of natural gas is that it's gonna have associated natural gas. Um, and because the production of the oil is going to be relatively profitable and there'll be a market for it, um, they're looking for new markets for the natural gas because, you know, it, there's going to be some sort of stranded gas. There's going to be a problem of creating markets for the natural gas either to California or to Mexico. So, so the question is, um, uh, and, and so we, we used an average price for natural gas of $3.00. At the time we, you know, we began this exercise, um, there was a big deficit between oil prices and natural gas prices. And I'll show you some trends in terms of um, how that's changed over time. But at the time we did the exercise, um, you know, one of the interesting things is you can lock in prices um, in the futures market. Um, and so we use the futures curve. Um, because what that means on a commercial basis is if you're a fleet and you're thinking of changing over um, from oil to natural gas, you could basically lock in, you know, it, we you need about a dollar to a dollar fifty differential between the two commodities, and you could basically lock that in in the futures market using derivatives. So, so when we did this exercise, you know, we assumed that there'd be players who'd be able to do that, and we're seeing some of that in the state. And, and this map gives you sort of a schematic of um, you know, where would the locations for these stations be? And um, you know, would it be CNG or LNG? We looked at both central facilities for creating the LNG, um, and also we looked, we, we had the other technology which is developing, um, which is small scale um, CNG and LNG uh, uh, capacity where you have just a small modular um, box, basically, they call it, you know, LNG in a box that you can put down at a station that has connection to a natural gas pipeline. So um, we found that the network was actually pretty commercial, that at a 12% rate of return, um, you could, you could, it would be commercial um, if there was a certain number of trucks uh, came to market, which would be about double the number of trucks we have today. And getting to that level of trucks is not so, so hard if the market gives the incentive, because unlike passenger vehicles, which are very hard to incentivize, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to switch to a certain car, um, you know, you have individual choices. Um, with fleets, you get companies um, like those servicing Walmart and others that buy these vehicles, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 vehicles at a time. And also, they turn over a lot faster than passenger cars. In freight, 
um, a typical trailer turns over after three years. So, um, so one of the constraints, even though the turnover is so large and you could get the network going, you know, relatively quickly, um, is you know, can you resell the trailer? If I'm a um, I'm a, a, a fleet operator and I'm switching to this, you know, more slightly more expensive technology, and I'm hoping that the commodity price is going to pay me back, um, or maybe I get some kind of a assistance program so that the technology pays me back. Um, I have to consider the resale of the trailer. Um, so one of the interesting opportunities that I think is available today would be to get Mexico, which also has air quality concerns in the border areas between California and Mexico or between Texas and Mexico, also have a lot of air quality concerns, right? So it would be to get um, a, a collaboration going with Mexico so that they also had an initiative to switch to some of these vehicles, and therefore you'd have a resale market um, for, for the vehicles, because a lot of the vehicles today on the diesel side, once they've been used and they've, they've gone a certain distance in California or in Texas or other places, they're actually sold to, Mex to Mexico. So there could be an opportunity um, for collaboration that could take everything to renewable natural gas. So the really interesting opportunity is that, um, and, and this chart just shows you um, that it was, you know, uh, the futures market was giving you a pretty good discount um, to oil in, um, uh, in 2015, and, and now it's not really as attractive because the price of oil has come down um, and the price of natural gas has been, you know, a little bit more stable. But on a forward basis, um, my, my expectation is that the price of natural gas is going to actually continue to fall. Um, and so when you look at some of the projections that have been made in the past, um, you know, for, for CEC and, and other organizations, there were assumptions that the price of natural gas would average somewhere between 4 to $6 per MCF to be able to get these more expensive natural gas fields to get produced, and that's not really going to happen. What's actually going to happen, in my opinion, is that you're having these new very large plays, you know, in the Permian Basin, in the Niobrara, um, in the Marcellus, that are going to produce natural gas at under a dollar. Um, and but on the oil side, which we, those of you who watch the news this week, the economic news, you know, we still have OPEC and other geopolitical factors that, that do keep some lift in the oil price, even as demand might disappear as we switch to more alternative energy. You still have these sort of geopolitical factors um, that keep the price of oil a little on, on the higher side than maybe the market would justify based on potential supply. So it is possible that you'd have this commercial incentive for natural gas. So then in California, that means we have to ask ourselves, you know, are, are we concerned about fossil natural gas? You know, we had the accident at Liso Canyon, and, and you know, it, there, there's some difficulties with natural gas, environmental difficulties and climate effects. So the question is, you know, how... How, 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 how much potential is there in this transition? And I think what our research shows really is that the kinds of credits that we have um, through the carbon markets, whether that's the low carbon fuel standard um, and also the national renewable fuel standard, that, um, that those credits are enough actually to bring a, tr a, a substantial amount of renewable natural gas into our network and, and probably beyond. Um, and so, therefore, having this natural gas build out um, probably is a transition uh, fuel. In other words, if we, as things switch to gaseous um, fuel in the freight industry, there's a high possibility that that very same infrastructure without any additional investment, um, just for the investment coming just for, to bring the source gas from renewable sources, um, really could fill the entire network um, that would be established for, 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 for freight um, in California and, you know, as I said, maybe beyond in Mexico or, or, or other places. So, um, so this, uh, this slide here um, shows you the volume of each of the different sources that could come on um, under a $120 uh, um, LCFS credit. Um, which is, you know, roughly where the market's been um, today. If you, um, so that, it, that adds up with all the different sources, 
to be about 14 BCF of renewable natural gas, which is about 85% of what kind of, of the volume of fossil natural gas that's going into trucks today in California. Now, the interesting opportunity is if you added the RIN credits, um, which exist today. I mean, you know, I guess we have a new presidential election. We don't know what the fate uh, of the RINs is going to be, though, uh, when he was campaigning, President-elect Trump uh, expressed his support for um, biofuels. So with the RIN credits, um, it actually becomes four times as much renewable natural gas is com can be commercially brought into the California network, um, so about 85 uh, BCF. So it really has a lot of potential, um, given the markets that are already set up, um, to at least do the early part of the uh, supply curves that Nathan showed uh, prior to uh, now. And um, uh, to put it uh, on a map, since uh, that's the advantage we have doing geospatial, yeah? That's per um, ton of carbon. Right, so, right, a ton of carbon avoided. Yes. Equivalent, equivalent. So, um, so this gives you sort of some um, locational uh, uh, um, a diagram of where is the most commercial um, RNG uh, by type and also location. Um, and you can see sort of its proximity to I-5. So uh, as Nathan mentioned, um, we have sort of some luck of geography um, when it comes to the sources um, because, of course, the distance to pipeline and distance to um, what would be the filling stations is, is a material part of the cost. Um, and you can see that um, they're also um, the distance to the ports, which would be a place where you'd have a lot of demand for um, these vehicles. Um, it is also, you know, pretty well clustered. Uh, we have some resource that's pretty well clustered. And um, I think we found uh, in our analysis that L.A. Basin, Long Beach and L.A. Port, um, that this is probably a, a really great place to start with a cluster um, because, of, as Nathan mentioned, there's one very large landfill source um, that's fairly commercial um, that could be brought on and, and with the, uh, not much, very profitably, I guess I would say, um, compared to you know, some of the other sources like dairy, which is a little more expensive uh, because you have to cluster it and uh, requires a lot of cleanup and equipment. Now, um, the other thing that was mentioned um, is the variable of the tipping fees. So, um, so, and there's a lot of variation in the tipping fee structure in the state. Let me add that there's also very, very high um, injection costs uh, for cleaned up RNG into the pipeline. Yes, yeah, so go ahead. Landfills. My understanding is that is the law requiring reduction of the waste going to landfills, but also all the organics are going to be eliminated. Correct. So how do you, do you take that into account? In theory, there will be less and less methane that will not be available. Correct. So, so we do take that into account, and I think the thing on some level, because I, I believe that the thing we used is the resources that are already in landfill, right? And so I think the way you need to think about it is that um, those resources were going to be available at a different source in the future, maybe MSW or, or other, and, um, and then that will be more expensive, um, but it, it's going to be over time, right? So our estimates for 2020, say, or 2025, um, you know, we're not using up the landfill gas that already exists now without the diversion. Um, so I, I think the way you have to think about it is in the very long time scale, um, that rule and those changes will be material. Um, but hopefully, you know, by the time that would be true, uh, we would have other more advanced vehicles. So, um, so there's an opportunity too, and I know this has been very controversial in the state with 
um, some of the questions about how recycling should be handled and whether um, fees can be charged for um, the groups in charge of, of, of handling the material. Um, but we did find a lot of sensitivity to um, changes or, or the level of the tipping fees um, in terms of uh, propelling more commercial um, volume of renewable natural gas. And um, that is, uh, so you can see the, the statistic here, if there was an increase in the tipping fees by 20%, and we try to do some sensitivities, um, you can see that for MSW, um, that dramatically increases uh, the volume that would become available. And, and I think one has to think about, you know, how, how would that be implemented, um, given the fact that the tipping fees are highly localized um, and somewhat controversial. Um, but, you know, could the state have some influence through policy to set a floor price, a, a recommended floor price for tipping fees for MSW or something like that, that would give it just a little bit more of an incentive, especially given the fact that we're wanting to divert uh, more waste out of landfill. Um, it might be an interesting exercise to think about mechanisms, market mechanisms that could um, establish uh, more universal tipping fees that would provide an incentive uh, to bring the renewable natural gas into transportation. And, and, and I mention um, here something that I think a lot of people who know this market already know, which is that there are very high injection costs currently um, to put RNG into the pipeline system in California. Um, and there are all kinds of um, reasons for that having to do with environmental protection and, and, and um, you know, security and, and so forth, um, safety. But the end result is we have the low carbon fuel standard and there is the RFS credits which now apply. And so we're getting a huge amount of volume of RNG being put into the pipeline in Texas and shipped to California. And so those same molecules are in the pipeline. Um, and they're just being put into the pipeline at a different juncture point, um, which eventually will be Colorado as well. Um, they're being put in a different junction point, and they're still in that same pipeline. And, you know, so this, th there's sort of a, a, an opportunity to think about the fact that it's already being done safely from other locations, and that uh, maybe one could think about um, you know, what, what's really needed, what would be the optimum uh, balance of safety and environment versus cost, um, given the priority to get RNG into the system. Consequences. I mean, you, I thought that big trucks, that the, we had the big trucks for 15, 20 years, but you're saying they're after three years, they are replaced. And if we start sending a lot of trucks to Mexico, they're going to be used in natural gas. They have to be used with natural gas. Natural gas. There are problems associated with fugitive methane emissions that may be a bit worse over there. So I will, I, if we do that, I will just translate it, our emissions or incentivize it, more emissions in Mexico instead of so, cleaning so, up California? So we, we, if I'm not mistaken, somebody can correct me if I'm misinformed on this, we have rules about how vehicles coming from Mexico into California have to comply with our own standards, right? And also, those users are going to have the same incentives as users in California to switch to renewable natural gas um, to get the credits. So if those trucks are used for internal travel in Mexico, you know, uh, if they are um, used in heavy duty and they're used on fossil natural gas, um, there is, pro depending on the drive cycle, um, there's probably still a carbon savings, um, a small carbon savings. Uh, depending on the technology. And as the technology improves and becomes more efficient, which we expect over time, um, as we get to better natural gas vehicles, it probably is going to, would probably be a neutral. It depends on the... Right, 
Right. Exactly. So, so here, Rosa, why don't you take the microphone? You can explain it. Yeah, so what I was saying is that the um, carbon footprint depends very much on the technology more than the fuel, depending on whether, you know, the engine is more efficient than the uh, engine you were substituting. So if these natural gas cars, uh, via, uh, trucks going into the secondary market in Mexico were substituting all their diesel fuels, then they are a benefit. They, they, they offer a benefit. If they are being bought instead of newer diesel trucks, maybe they're not. So, so, so we, 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 yeah, so we use the methane leakage EDF numbers in doing our analysis for the life cycle analysis. So we're aware of the methane leakage issue. And, and, and let me just add, um, I just add this point. Um, I mean, unless we get into an electoral format where we, um, we ban natural gas, both here and in Mexico, um, in the meantime, the, the, the natural gas that gets produced because we're needing the oil for fuel is going to be flared if it doesn't go into trucks. So you have to also look at, you know, what would the other use be um, if it wasn't going into transportation. Um, so, um, but, I, you know, I think that even without the methane rules, um, that would have been put in place by the Obama administration, and you know, unclear what their fate is going to be, um, because of pressure from the investment community um, and the public. I I believe that a lot of the top operators in natural gas will actually do what they need to do to um, capture the methane from their production process. So I think over time you'll see that those EDF numbers will go down because over the last 10 years, a lot of the operators in the natural gas, you know, fracking and, and, and uh, work over um, production areas in Oklahoma and Arkansas Oklahoma, and, and, and elsewhere, even in Pennsylvania, you had a lot of, a lot of players. There wasn't consolidation in the industry. You know, any three geologists who could get together with a Wall Street firm was a company. Um, and so you had a lot of marginal areas being produced because the price of oil was so high and the price of natural gas at that time was high. Um, and so you had a lot of bad practices, both in terms of water and in terms of methane leakage. Um, so I think over time, I would expect that to improve um, because I think that the players that are going to survive in the industry at the lower cost structure are those who have better facilities and better practices. But it is an issue. Before we take more questions, do you want to finish up the rest of your slides so people online that have yeah, time constraints so let me can just, see them all? Um, let me just you know, briefly say that, um, of course, the, um, the carbon intensity of the different sources and the, um, the amount of supply is absolutely tied to um, uh, a function of the LCFS credits or, or the combination of credits, and that um, I think one of the interesting opportunities for renewable natural gas is that um, is that unlike some of other some other alternative fuel alternatives, um, we already have infrastructure there, and we already have the low carbon fuel standard in place. Um, and some of the other credits, there's some tipping fees in place, and we have the renewable fuel standard in place. And so it's easier to propel this market um, than maybe some of the other alternative uh, fuels that we'll want to transition to over time um, because we already have, it's already, I, I'm, you know, it's always hard when, when you stand up and you say that something's already commercial, um, then people split hairs about what do you mean by commercial. But given the market conditions, we have in the market today, um, and given the credit incentives we have in the market today, uh, it doesn't require a lot of intervention to get this, this business going, I guess I would say, in our opinion. And so uh, let me just go through my, our broad conclusions before to make sure, because uh, I know we're getting near time. Um, 
Nathan's talked about um, the potential, um, which is the equivalent of 750 million gasoline gallons um, per year. Uh, we believe that RNG can achieve significant market penetration um, uh, and, and replace fossil natural gas over time. Uh, my, my opinion is looking at the analysis, given the range of credits um, that are in place today, um, really all of the fossil natural gas in the state could be replaced with renewable natural gas. Um, we talked about the tipping fee increases. Um, if we wanted to expand the network, um, a revisiting view on tipping fees might be an additional way to incent um, higher RNG production of MSW as we shift to MSW processes being more important in the state. And um, uh, we showed you the um, sensitivity of the resource to the pipeline costs. And so thinking about um, interconnection fees and um, other kinds of barriers that exist today, um, that also could be a fruitful place for policy to um, evaluate uh, what's possible in terms of bringing some of the connection costs down. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, so we'll start to take some questions. Hi, Amy and Nathan. Julia Levin with the Bioenergy Association of California. Thank you. This is incredibly interesting and a lot of helpful data. I do have a lot of questions about the assumptions behind it. Um, I don't know if there's a report behind this that you're going to be releasing, if it's in final or draft format, but um, I have four or five questions and I could probably ask 20 more, but things like you have a much lower number of facilities in every sector except dairies than actually exist. I mean, there are over 400 wastewater treatment facilities that have AD on site. There are you know, over 300 landfills in California. It would be helpful to explain why you're using much smaller numbers. You don't have to do it right now, but just as kind of an example. And you know, your conclusion about the potential without a clarification that that's the economically, commercially competitive potential using only LCFS and RIN values. What about other state incentives? I mean, the PUC has a $40 million pipeline interconnection incentive program. There's cap and trade money. So it's not clear, are you including any other economic incentives, public incentives, in addition to LCFS and RIN credits? And then have you looked at the two open and really important PUC proceedings that are going to revisit some of the pipeline biogas standards. And you know, for dairy projects now, interconnection will be rate-based. And potentially, for all projects in the future, the PUC has to consider that before it uses up the current incentive program. So there are potentially huge changes in some of the costs. And I guess that's where I'm worried that you're actually lowballing the potential based on the current economics. And that that, while it's still very exciting, sends a message that it's actually quite limited to the current natural gas production. So, so let use. me address that in a general way, and then I'll let Nathan handle some of the more, more specifics. Um, and, and that has to do with study approach. So of course, the state is providing a lot of incentive to the dairies, and, and there's talk about even you know, the state providing the capital cost for certain facilities. And, and there are a lot of those um, questions. And obviously, the more money the state pours into this resource, the more volume is going to be available. So we, what we looked at is we were asked to look at the commercial feasibility, right? And in looking at commercial feasibility, one would look at these more limited market-based things that are sustainable over time and are not related to uh, the state's intervention in a more direct way in terms of capital costs or, or, or so forth. So that, that is how we define the program, right? And uh, indeed, because we used a $3 natural gas price at a time when, you know, which provided a certain, uh, at the time, a certain, a, a certain banned oil. Um, and, and actually, natural gas prices are, uh, and oil prices are, have shifted. Uh, as I discussed, um, some of the commerciality that we actually have is probably exaggerated um, because the natural commercial incentive is the natural gas price is low and the price of oil is low. Some of these numbers would be less commercial and it would be much more harder for renewable natural gas to compete with $2 
fossil gas than it is with $3 fossil gas. So, you know, we can go back and revisit it and add things to this model. It's very easy to do because we have every, all the data stretched out, and we've done several exercises where we've changed the price of natural gas and oil so that we could show the sensitivity to that, and we could add um, scenarios where we put in the state put providing capital funding. But in the end, to have a very sustainable industry over time, it needs to move away from being a public state-funded industry. Those are very specific findings based on current LCFS and RIN credit values, and that really needs to be the second half of the statement, or it's incredibly misleading. Well, I, we, we said that it's based on current LCFS. Well, Nathan didn't say that when he made the comment about the 86% of biogas comes from dairies, and it doesn't say it right there. It just says, it sounds like an absolute RNG production potential, and it's not. It's based on current so economic on the, on the dairy question, that is the manure potential, the biogas uh, potential for manure, uh, the 86%, so, and that's based on the total being what uh, the livestock head uh, and the biogas potential from all the different pigs, cows, uh, chickens in California that is in the California Biomass Collaborative Resource Assessments. Um, that the 86% of the technically available biogas potential from those things are in our model. Um, for the... No. For, so 86% of the manure potential is represented in our spatial model. 14% for, uh, is chickens and turkeys and pigs and th that data I did not have. So um, so I, I, at that point, that, that number was only related to the dairy, dairy resource, I mean the manure-based resource, not the... Uh, so on the question about things that are not in here that, that are in bigger uh, uh, landfills, uh, so I, I, I refer back to the biomass collaboratives, biomass resource assessment for most of my uh, knowledge about what the grand gross potential is. Um, and in there, uh, the, land, the landfill gas potential, which is calculated in a rather different manner, which is look, they uh, look at the, the total state just waste in place, basically, uh, and like, as if we have one giant landfill in the state. Um, and the total resource we come up with, with the limited number of facilities that are in the landfill methane outreach programs uh, data set is, it's, I think we lost about eight or nine billion cubic feet. So we're, we're capturing the biggest sources. Uh, on the wastewater treatment plant, you're right, we're, we're, we are missing some of those. Um, and some of those are facilities that are currently using their biogas um, for other sources, for, for, for other resources. Um, we got the data from the California Association of Sanitation um, uh, Agencies. There's the A, <laughs> CASA. Um, so there, there is some, and in that case, uh, the, 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 gray, the, the total that was in, uh, data that I used before I started the project from the California Biomass Resource Board, we lost two billion cubic feet um, with looking at a much smaller resource. So I, I feel like we're, we're capturing, in this sense, we're capturing a lot of the bigger uh, sources, which are most likely to be the more economic sources. Uh, and we have not fully analyzed those other sources that we're missing, so I can't say that that is definitely true. Um, and I think the point is one of time scale, right? So we're doing a study out to 2030. Um, so you don't have to have every last resource. We're trying to identify the least cost, most commercial resource. And so the fact that there's some resource out there that's not captured, given the smallness of the market today, and the possibility of growth in the number of trucks 
are, is, is limited to a certain number. I think in that way, the fact that there might be some resource that's not captured in the number is not material in a commercial way, right? And I think that that's really not what people should focus on, on the, you know, how many units of something there is. What we really need to focus on, and I, I feel this very strongly from my work for four years in this area of alternative fuels in California, we need to focus on what can be scaled up. How do we minimize the cost to the state and the public for subsidizing or incentivizing infrastructure, new infrastructure? What new infrastructure can we build that would be dual use? In other words, we're building infrastructure today that might unfortunately be, have to be in, me, in the in short term supplied with fossil, part fossil material, but that could be easily and costlessly transformed to use the same infrastructure to be with low carbon sources, right? So that is sort of the point of the exercise to look at renewable natural gas because it is the most potential source, except maybe, you know, drop in diesel, biodiesel. You know, renewable natural gas is, the, is a high potential source where you could transition, where you could get the oil industry to invest in the fossil facilities and they would make some amount of profit over a period of time because it was commercial today for their resource. And then the state could intervene to ensure that all that same infrastructure is shifted to low carbon sources, right? So that's really the way one has to think about it conceptually. And, you know, when, when people make maps of the United States and say there's enough of this source to supply all demand in the United States, you know, that's not as material as how long is it going to take me to put in the infrastructure to use that resource. And we have this incredible opportunity in California, and I'm not saying it should be renewable natural gas because we have another study which we hope to visit with you about whether it could be hydrogen or what the other options are or even electrification um, at some level. But in the end, we have this giant opportunity for the fact that unlike other locations in the country, we have high flow volume for freight and, and a single source highway, which limits the number of, of changes we have to make to fueling infrastructure and keeps that cost very low to shift it to a low carbon source. And freight is a very high percentage of our transportation emissions in the state. And unlike passenger vehicles, where we all know, because we've been dealing with this subject for you know, years, it's very hard. I mean, I personally have a plug-in car, but it's very hard to get consumers to purchase a plug-in car. You know, and some of it's cost, some of it's range anxiety, some of it's just lack of knowledge, right? Um, so, so, but my point to you is, in the freight industry, you're dealing with centralized players who can be incentive through policy. You could, those incentives could eventually be lifted because the process is going to be commercial on its own. That is why this is such an important area and was worth studying. I, you know, commend the ARB for focusing on this resource because it is one of the most commercially possible ways to decarbonize, you know, freight, which is an important thing to decarbonize. And also it has the benefit of air quality, right, of improving air quality around our ports and at the border. So, you know, it just has a lot of potential. And I think that that's really what we need to focus on in this study, which is just a simulation. And I'm sure that you know, somebody could sit down with, you know, what was the cost we used for natural gas and what is the cost we used for dairies and did we cluster these five instead of those five? I mean, there is no question when you read the 100-page study or maybe it's a 150-page study, you know, there are going to be multiple things you're going to find in the choices we made for this simulation that don't suit people. But really, you would be losing the broad picture, which is that this sector has a lot of potential and not much change has to be made in policy to get it off the ground, which I think is your point, because it's already getting off the ground. Also, I wanted to um, reiterate that the final report is available on the website, so you can um, download that to get more information about the assumptions. I also want to thank the research team. You've been really incredible to work with and very responsive. Um, the dairy cluster analysis is actually not in the initial 
um, a proposal and we added that as a request that came up when we were developing the Shore Live Climate Pollutant Strategy. So they've been incredibly responsive. Our wish list of analyses are still long. But we have limited research dollars, but I'm sure this team would be <laughs> uh, happy to help you in um, any other analysis that your entities would like to fund. Um, so we just have one more, a uh, couple more questions and one from Jim. Hi, Amy. Jim Boyd. Um, and I'm going to build a context for my question because you've talked about four years on alternative fuels. Let me just say I've got about 30 years in California government on alternative fuels. Well, I, I did alternative fuels before, just okay. not for California. Okay, give you the... Um, Nationally. And... Um, that would be 30 years for me, too. Okay. Well, now you're not as old as me, anywhere close to it. In any event, um, I've always been an advocate of waste energy which has struggled in California for, for decades. I want to thank you for yet an, in, uh, for our, another report that goes, unfortunately, on the heap of reports that have been done within this state. And my friends at the Energy Commission, where I spent 10 years, along with uh, my fellow commissioner, Julia Levin, um, has a library full of assessments of, of this subject, and I hope they get considered by my friends at the ARB where I spent 20 years they're not trying to reinvent a lot of data. But my real point is um, two concerns. One, uh, I'm disappointed that uh, forest biomass, forest waste, one of the three tranches of waste, I mean, this urban, ag, and forest are not included, particularly in the face of um, 102 million dead trees in California, which many of us said for years we're going to get as well as burn down California's forests if we don't start doing something with those materials. But that aside, um, another concern of 20 plus years is the economics. It's never been positive economics. It's getting more positive for the reasons you point out of LCFS, RINs, et cetera, et cetera. But there's the elephant in the room of all the societal benefits that have f first not recognized, now recognized, even semi-quantified, but never monetized <clears throat> in any way and put into this equation of why all of this waste energy arena <clears throat> excuse me, gets more and more attractive, mainly because it doesn't generate cash today that you can move from column A to column B to provide the subsidy, but it's got to be considered if we're going to move waste to energy. The state has promised to do these studies for years and it seemingly never gets done. And I just appeal to you for either comments and or support for doing that because it would move this whole thing even more rapidly than you've moved it with, with these findings. But I do agree with Julia's concerns about how people can interpret this narrowly. Um, you did say, I, I, you, your last comments were a perfect bridge to, to my feelings and my comments. But secondly, earlier you mentioned something about the, the you know, my terms, diversified portfolio of fuels that you need to approach. That was the policy of the state for many years, pursuant to reports to the legislature, many years worth of Energy Commission, Integrated Energy Policy reports that I think we've strayed away from pretty sadly in terms of a, of a commitment to only certain fuels in certain areas. RNG has become acceptable because the heavy duty arena is really struggling to come up with solutions to the problem, but originally it was going to be more than that. But that aside, if um, somehow or another we could um, monetize these other values, we could move this subject along much more rapidly, well beyond the narrow views of my friends at the ARB um, to the broader views of the whole state and it's all of the, the policy makers aspiring to be policy makers in the room here to understand the context of this which has been going on ad infinitum. What so, do you so think I, is going to happen? So, so, Anything? so let, me, let me tell you because a lot of times in California um, there's a focus on California. California did this 10 years ago. California did this 20 years ago. California is going to do this in 10 years, right? And we, we tend to think of ourselves um, in a bubble, 
now we're, you know, California not in the same direction as the nation of the United States. You know, we, we're, we're always thinking of ourselves uh, in this silo. And the truth is, Europe has banned landfill, totally banned landfill, you know, partly because of the methane consequence of, of landfill, but also because of, you know, just space, right? And therefore, people take different actions in Europe. Uh, there's a much larger bio industry. There's a huge potential now emerging freight, by waste to energy freight business. Um, even people are talking about putting it into ships. And in addition to that, you have the, what I call the circular economy movement, where people don't have what we have in the United States, which is the buy it, throw it away culture, right? Where I buy something, I decide I want something better than that, and so I take it over to the landfill and I buy something new, right? So I have much more hope um, than many other people, and that is because I deal with young people all day at a university, and I find this new generation to be very distinct from my students, and I, I hate to say it, I just very young looking. I, we're probably the same age, right? right? So I've been dealing with students for 30 years, and I can tell you the young people today are more willing to think about waste to energy, they're more willing to think about the circular economy, and they're, you know, behind some of these solutions. So I'm actually fairly optimistic, and, you know, my message for the oil and gas industry is that they have a unique opportunity today, instead of fighting California's policies, to participate in California's policies through this avenue, and have a participation in the low carbon fuel standard, not in a minimal way, but in an embrace it in a multi-year way to get this infrastructure built and to participate in biofuels, which is something they've all tried to do. I just wanted to um, reiterate that on December 19th, we're having a seminar about drop-in fuels, and actually that research project is looking at multiple pathways to make renewable diesel from um, woody biomass. So I think that that will be of interest to a lot of you too, and it sort of fills in um, a broader picture that we have for alternative fuel research at ARB. And then in the spring, we'll be having a seminar about new um, life cycle assessments for renewable uh, hydrogen, um, all of which are feeding into our LLCFS and the short of climate clean strategy. So um, yeah, there's a lot of exciting research coming out. Um, Nathan, did you want to respond? Yeah, so uh, as someone who's written four or five of those reports that are sitting on the shelves in CEC and never got commented on even. Um, I, uh, so I, I, I'm a little young to be in a similar position as everybody else of, is anything gonna happen with this stuff? So um, on the question on the forest woody biomass, uh, we've done a number of studies. We actually had it, we had it, we, in a preliminary analysis of this, we, we did, uh, methane from woody biomass it is a huge in, increase in the total potential resource if you uh, produce methane from uh, woody biomass uh, compared to just the sources that we looked at. We got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of pushback on that um, for wanting uh, the, the woody biomass going to other resources and, and if we we, it may actually still, we, I think we still have a curve in the report on that. Um, so we haven't highlighted it here. Uh, what was I gonna say? I, <laughs> you had a long question. Um, <laughs> uh, so on the, in terms of the, uh, yeah, on the uh, monetizing all of the various benefits for uh, waste energy, and there's, and that's kind of a, it's this problem because it's nothing pays for it by itself. And you have to put together all of these pieces to make it work. And so it's really complex. So it's not surprising that it hasn't worked out because um, it is a hard problem to fix and people are fixing other problems first. Uh, but there's a lot of, uh, so one, one aspect that I think is promising is a, a so I left, I moved to Arizona, so I, I'm in a completely different world now. Uh, but I understand that, that, that there's a, 
move heading towards a organic waste uh, ban in the landfills. And so that's going to be a huge, uh, you're going to have to do something with it. The, the tipping fees uh, for where that can go can, can, will increase uh, significantly um, as they don't no longer have a just bury it option. Um, and so there's, so, the, so that's a, that's a problem, positive development. There's also, you know, there's, there are other aspects with waste energy items that are not always all good. So some of the, uh, the air quality, uh, if you're, if a lot of this uh, resource ends up in the, uh, into the, the Central Valley and that there you have pretty big issues with trying to develop small scale uh, combustion processes uh, to, to make those things economic. So there's a little bit of, uh, in, in my response, I, I would say that, that we need to, you, you got to cover all the bases and you got to hit everything um, and that that's uh, both positive and negative. For I was I was just going to comment on, I think it will cover both kind of comments because it has to do, oh, right. It has to do, it's, it's questions about how we do the modeling, right? Whether we include this or that or whether we're re reinventing the wheel. I think it's good to revisit the studies every now and then because we've learned something new. In terms of what we include in the modeling, I think it's right to point out things where we might be underestimating the potential, but I think it's our role to, to, to point out the, the, the places where we are overestimating the potential. And as Amy said, we are considering a $3 per million BTU natural gas, where it's more, more in the like $2 range. And uh, um, in terms of the carbon intensity of renewable natural gas, which is uh, my expertise in this study, is studying the, analyzing the carbon intensity of the different fuels, I would say that renewable natural gas gets a huge benefit from being considered a waste product because basically the majority of the benefit comes from these avoided emissions that we, we are basically, they're not happening because we're collecting it. In the case of natural gas, it could also be treated uh, in big part as a waste by product of oil production. And like Amy said, in many cases, if you don't use it, it would be either vented or flared. And we're not considering this in the carbon intensity of natural gas. So while I understand your concerns and your concerns that you know our modeling is not perfect. I, I would like to, to just you know suggest and, and sh to, to explain and, and we can I mean our, our report is out there, and you know we're always happy to discuss our assumptions and see, and then you know we we once we, we have the models so we can test the sensitivities. What if we add this? What if we add that? Which which one has a biggest impact? But I think you know. In general, we're doing what's, you know, like best available information can be included. And, and Yeah, and I, I, I agree totally with that. That's a problem with modeling in general and any, you know, studies that you have there from universities, from consulting. You know, my point is there's other studies out there on the, new, on the potential of renewable natural gas in the States that are much, much larger, that they, they find much larger quantities than us, but you have to go and review their assumptions too. I mean, that's a problem with all the studies. And they're saying, yeah, you have this big potential. So, I mean, you have to question there. There's two, right? And it's actually, you know, consistent, I think, with the discussion. I'll, I'll take the opposite approach. I'm going to commend you guys for being realistic in some of your observations about what the potential is. And they may still be overinflated. I can speak to the dairy industry, um, you know, working closely with them for the last 15 years on these issues. 
you know, we're not going to build more than 100 to 200 dairy digesters in California. And I think your analysis probably assumes a larger number than that. And that's where, you know, there's, you know, that's reality. A lot of the smaller dairies are going to look at other ways of reducing methane. They're not going to build digesters, period. And so it's really important because I think a lot of the previous studies have overinflated the potential and overinflated the benefits. That's point one. So I commend you for trying to be realistic, especially with policymakers. We need to be because we tend to overinflate the benefits. Second point is um, one area I think you can really think about is um, looking, you, you mentioned the co-benefits of renewable natural gas and taking out diesel trucks and replacing with natural gas trucks. Um, I think your analysis m maybe misses where there's a real benefit there, and that's the regional trucking, and that's what we should really focus on if we want to maximize co-benefits. And so that 99 corridor and probably that 10 corridor from the ports out to the warehouses on, you know, in San Bernardino and Riverside, those are two corridors to really focus on in terms of if we're going to get bang for the buck for replacing fleets, we ought to focus on those fleets because that's going to give us the co-benefits in those two regions that we should be shooting for. And so I think that regional agricultural hauling in the San Joaquin Valley, you know, really is, it gets lost in, in when you look at just I-5. So, so we actually capture that. And if you go through the whole study, I mean, you know, we're talking about a 30, presenting 150 pages in 30 minutes. I mean, we, we talk about the air quality implications, um, especially for around the ports and in agricultural areas. So, uh, and we also talk about how much more commercial it is if the fuels can be used in those areas instead of being coming into the general grid. Um, but I think I'll, I'll leave you all with this sort of last point. Um, and I get the point about all the different studies and, and so on and so forth. Um, but just to you know, toot our horn for one more second. Um, if you want to describe the model that we used in a more general way, you would say it's a flows model. In other words, we're having the flows of the fuel and freight uh, simulated by a computer. Indeed, if you were a Fortune 500 oil company trying to determine where to put gasoline stations or diesel stations or whatever, uh, the industry also uses flows models, right? So I think that um, I can't speak to the other studies. I'm sure some of them have used flows models and others haven't. Um, I do think there's a benefit to thinking about it in a flows model way, because that is how the industry thinks about building stations and terminals and production facilities. Um, and so that, I think, would be my advice to the state, is to think about the infrastructure in the same way that the industry thinks about the infrastructure. Um, and, uh, and then the co-benefits you know, fall out from that because you can geospatially locate where you have the worst air quality districts or where you have the other, you know, other incentives, whether it's waste incentive or some other kind of incentive. And because this study and other studies are, have mapped it, then obviously the state and air quality and so forth can take these other considerations into account and work with those districts to think about what other kinds of incentives that would capture some of these other benefits could be put in place to make sure that those areas get done first. Thank you so much, uh, Amy and Nathan and Rosa uh, and Daniel. <laughs> um, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it.